speaker today is Tom Bauer. Uh, it's an environmental engineer with a master in civil engineering in water and wastewater. He has 30 years of experience in the research and consulting and is a senior engineer and SPO consultant. His uh, title uh, is a case study of wastewater treatment plant water in carbon assessment. Twenty years, that's impressive. I have ten years. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> um, so similar to John Ferguson, I'm going to start by saying SPL doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we are now WSP. Uh, we're in that group of companies. I guess we exist till the end of the year, so we haven't integrated. But uh, So I'm going to be talking about a wastewater uh, treatment plant where we conducted an odor survey. And hopefully a little bit different, I'm going to talk, um, similar to John's points, a little bit about the legislation, not much, he covered it very well, as well as looking at why we picked this wastewater treatment plant to be a kind of in our study. So I'm going to talk about kind of the requirements in Ontario at the time this facility was constructed. Uh, we're going to talk about the municipal class environmental assessment. It's a very different route, but also a way of controlling odor and happened to be the way this facility's odor had to be controlled. And then we're going to dive into the whole case study, look at the sources, look at the sampling procedures we used. I got a few slides of results and then kind of the summary associated with it. So in Ontario, we have the legislation. Uh, the Environmental Protection Act clearly says that you can't cause an adverse effect. Uh, at the time, this facility, being about 10 to 12 years ago, applied for an expansion. Uh, at the time, the Ministry of the Environment, not the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, because that's a new thing, but now they're the MOECC. Um, so they use detectable odor. That's that one odor unit, DT per meter cubed, um, where half the population can kind of detect something over a 10-minute period as their guideline. They would force compliance from the guideline by putting that number into the ECA 12 years ago, saying, thou shalt not emit more than one odor unit. And this caused, of course, a lot of headaches for a lot of companies around that time period. Um, the real direct number, though, is how many complaints are you actually getting against your facility? Um, and this has a lot to do with, as we've heard today, setbacks, who your neighbors are, um, even if you have a sensitive neighbor or not. And then the public, of course, ultimately protection by that statement, the loss of the normal loss of enjoyment and normal use of property, which is the definition under the EPA for an adverse effect. So under municipal class environmental assessment, so this is how the company basically got out of the ECA process and being permitted odor that way, you have a public input period. We want to expand our wastewater treatment plant. The public comes, you talk, they have ideas. Um, there's down and plus sides. If you ever attended a PIC, whatever they can Google is open. They will ask almost anything they can find on Google. And if you Google waste or treatment plants and odor, it's not good news usually. So the, the MCE, they try to compare these complaints back to legislation, but at the end of the day, whatever you agree to in your EA now becomes your requirements. So in this case, uh, the wastewater treatment plant, I said 10 years ago, I think it was actually 12 years ago now, it's been a couple of years, but um, it triggered an expansion, they did an MCEA, and they came away with that they will not increase odors from their facility. A more broader statement I couldn't think of. It doesn't tie it to throughput, it doesn't tie it to expansion, it just says we will not increase our odors. So the good news for the facility, they've had no odor complaints recently. Um, probably the last six years, I think they've said they've been odor complaint free. They're in the middle of doubling capacity again right now, so we'll see if that continues. Um, and the MCEA, it actually identified the 12 sources they had to monitor on a yearly or biennially basis where they had to monitor these sources for odor and compare it to previous results. So in this case, there were seven area sources at the facility. So we had a grit surface tank, an exit channel, a clarifier, and exit channel for the clarifier. There were three aeration tanks that we studied. Um, two were aerobic and one was anoxic. And then there were five source points, basically. There was the inlet pump station to the whole facility. Uh, there was a carbon absorber on site that exhausted to the air. They had a treatment building that had a general ventilation system. Uh, the biosolids loading building as well, when they loaded trucks to get the biosolids off site. And then they had a two biofilter system installed. 
So looking at the area sources, um, we've already kind of covered this when Anna talked. We have passive sources. So these are sources, basically, you have that nice glass-like surface. Uh, the grit tanks, the grit tank exit, the clarifier and the clarifier exit were all considered to be passive. There's no active. Our active sources being aeration tanks, you can see by the picture there on top, <laughs> air moving up, you have a high agitated surface. You're going to get a lot more emissions from that type of, of surface um, comparatively. And then point sources, uh, one is neat, meaning we just suck it right out of the point. Sorry, four of them are neat. We suck them right out. And one of them was pre-diluted. We had to use nitrogen at a dilution of 8.5 to 1 to make sure there's no moisture in our bag when it went to the odor panel. So what did we do? Well, we followed the Ontario source testing code, uh, ON6 method. Um, you've heard a lot of people come up and tell you the certain things you can and can't use. And Anna talked about the differences between the acceptable flux chamber and then alternative methods. So everything I'm talking about here, it ties right back to what we're accepted to do in Ontario under the source testing code. Even though it wasn't a compliance level test, they needed to justify in their EA by showing they maintained a compliance level. Um, then they look at a historical. What, did, what were we compared to last time? Are we increasing? Um, simultaneously, we measured H2S from all the sources to see if there was a root cause for their odor. Um, they were very concerned about this. And then we pushed, um, we actually used Anna and she pushed for the same day odor analysis just because we do have H2S in some of the samples. Um, so the morning samples were analyzed in the afternoon and the afternoon samples were analyzed that evening. So for the source sampling, the passive, like I said, there's no forced air movement. Uh, the flux chamber was the Centroid SF450 and nitrogen gas, uh, I think it was 5.0 grade, was used to purge the system. For the area sources, these are our active sources where we have active bubbling. Mm -hmm. We use what would be considered the open bed filter system used in ON6. So air is coming up, it's captured in a cone sitting on the surface. You then duck that cone to a stack, there's about 10 centimeters and then you back calculate it based on area. Um, it's a very conservative method because we try to find a very active area to put that cone. So we're getting a high agitation zone versus a non-agitated zone. For our point sources, we use pre-dilution. So that's the Centroid DSS, or DS5, sorry. Uh, there's potential condensation from the biofilter. It's a very wet source. If you get condensation, the odor panel says, well, I'm not running that because you're gonna wreck my machine. Um, other reasons for doing that would be high temperature, high odor, things like that. So like I said, it was 8.5 to 1, nitrogen 5.0. For a neat source, that picture shows you exactly what a neat source is. We put a tube in the stack and we suck it into a lung sampler. Pretty straightforward. We cap it, we send it off to the lab. So looking at the results historically, so this would be 2012. This was a biannual test. In 2014, we performed the sampling. You can see really quickly, there's some pretty major, my carbon adsorber here at this, sorry, I'm moving away from the microphone. My carbon adsorber here at this end, it's very, very high, um, close to 1100% increase. And then at the other end, we have our biofilter has showed a small decrease, some aeration tank showed some decreases, um, as well as an aeration tank on the other end showing a very big increase in odor um, versus the previous study. There we go. So then our client who was also concerned about H2S being a root cause, so we measured H2S. As you can see here, the blue line is our H2S concentration pinned here on the other secondary axis. And the odor concentration are the green lines pinned to the primary axis. And it's not a nice hockey stick. So it's pretty much not a root cause in this case. Um, it's, if it was, our carbon absorber should have a huge H2S. Something else is there causing all that odor. Uh, we determined from the, during the field inspection, it was near the end of its life. They were about to replace the carbon within a week. Um, we gave them the heads up that everything should be running smoothly, and they said, ah, oh, we'll just wait another week. So this is their worst case carbon absorber almost. So then they just wanted to make sure that odor change versus H2S concentration. So if H2S, even though it didn't look like a root cause in the last graph, this one clearly shows it's not. We should see sloping and then increasing as we come across, i.e. if H2S is a root cause, it should be a higher percentage increase on our odor year over year. Uh, it clearly was not a root cause in our case. Um, so the client was pretty happy, although they were doing it again in a couple days. So as a quick summary of this specific wastewater treatment plant, 
we looked at what we call two-fold error. So this is one step on a olfactometer using the half dilutions. So if something was two-fold higher, it was considered significantly different in our case. And in this case, the primary clarifier surface and the carbon adsorber had concentrations that were two-folds higher versus the previous testing. And then similar thing, what was two-folds lower, what was actually decreased? We have the aeration tank, which was anoxic, and we have the biofilter. Both of those showed a two-fold decrease. So high variability from year to year. We saw a lot of 1,100% is a pretty big number, as is a lot of those being pluses. Well, we had different older labs, for starters. Um, we, we didn't do the 2012 sampling. Uh, Teflon bags versus Tedlar bags being used, as well as same-day H2S analysis. So because we had H2S, we had a same-day analysis. The previous lab followed the 24-hour period allowed under the Ontario Source Testing Code. And then the big thing coming out of this one is they were not allowed to increase their odor. So given my data, I can't tell them if they've increased their odor. I can tell them what the concentrations are. I can tell them their fans have changed speeds. Um, but there's no associated modeling whatsoever. We did do modeling for the client. They said, do not show that data. Um, and it, it's the one year only. Um, so we're gonna do it again and show the one year modeling again because they're getting ready for this doubling that they're about to perform. Um, so because there was nothing else, we're very qualitative in what we can say here with the municipal class environmental assessment being the overriding kind of jurisdictional just because there are no odor complaints for this facility. And that's it. I kept it simple. I kept it fast. Thank you. I have two quick questions. Did yep. you try to quantify what, uh, did you run any panel on the carbon exhaust? What could have been the cause of the order? Maybe the sulfur compounds, anything like that, did you try to identify? Yeah, all we looked at was they wanted to know if there was H2S and they didn't care about anything else. Um, the only thing we recommended post was that it was at the end of its life. I did look at the little tag that maintenance puts on and it was scheduled for replacement. The carbon. Yeah. And uh, in the graph when you show the source of fermentation, you have concentration with the orders. It would have been interesting to see actually the sources of ORP potential because it seemed like in the end all the sources with ORP at zero or below zero actually did have H2S as the main contributor and all the air or be positive sources did not, so they kind of actually need to be. Right. And that's just a generic.